the word I just used. So you got a, like a probability of making an A is something rough. So let's just say somebody thinks there's a 60% chance. Now what's the probability of making A given uh, you don't come to any more classes until the day of that test? What do you think that does to the probability of an A? Probably makes it go lower, right? Even if you watch my videos, you're still not getting the full effect. You're not going to be there in the moment, right? So maybe this goes down to like a 40% or something. So would you say that those are dependent on each other? The, the probability of getting an A, is that dependent on the probability that there's no more classes, that you don't attend class? Are they yes. dependent? Yes. yes, so there you go. If I ask you, are uh, female and sleeping um, sleeping six hours or whatever, you compare the probability that's a female to the probability that's a female given six hours of sleep. There's no reason that these, these should have any connection at all. There's no reason they should have any connection at all. None. So a lot of people are just comparing the probability of one directly to the probability of the other. There, there, there's no, there, there's nothing about them. Yes. Well, there you go. If one thing happening does not change the probability of the other. Now, in either one of these, did anything happen? This is the probability you pick a woman. Nothing happened, right? Yeah, I wasn't given any information. I wasn't told that something happened. This is probably getting six hours of sleep. Picking somebody who got get six hours of sleep. Did something happen? Did I tell you? No, I didn't tell you anything. Given that one of the things happened, does the other guy's probability change? So a lot of guys just compared these two directly. The next thing I had was people comparing uh, female, comparing it to six hours given female. But again, it's like comparing probability female to probability of six hours. Why in the world should they have any connection? They, there's no rhyme or reason to this. There's no reason they should have any connection. So I want to compare what is the probability of the thing by itself, and does the probability of the thing change if I know something further? That's the test for independence. So if every one of you looks at number... Which one? Are, number two... A and F. Look at your A and look at your 2F. Do you see how that feeds right into my question on 2G? I made you do the work already. You've already got the numbers just sitting there. You just got to point out to me that they're not equal to each other, those two numbers, right? All right. In some cases, it changed very little. But they're still not exactly the same, right? And in some cases, they changed drastically. In one case, it was a almost a 50% chance that it was a dude. But if I told you they slept five hours, now it was like a 20% chance dude. It affected it majorly, right? The probability of that event changed a lot. Okay, maybe, maybe. But to see if two things are dependent on each other, you see what the guy's probability is by itself, and you see what that thing's probability is Given the other dude, you compare those two things. If they're dependent, this guy will affect the probability of this guy. That's the whole idea of independence versus dependence. Is that? Yes. Oh, you're good. Okay. Yes. You have to show me. So it's not enough. I could have set this thing up. I could have totally set this thing up. In fact, let me see if some of you guys are with me on the math here. Uh, I really want you to understand this. So here's male, female. Here's uh, AT&T, Verizon. Who cares? Right? 
uh, if this was one and this is four, and I don't care what I put here, I don't care, but let's say this is 10 total people and this is uh, 40 total people. What's the probability that I pick uh, a, a, a man? How many total people do I have? 50. 50. What's probably I pick a man? 10 total men. Number out of 50, so it's one fifth. Now, let's probably pick a man given that they use AT&T. So how many people am I talking about now? Five. Five. And how many of those people are men? One. One. So are man and AT&T dependent for this, or independent for this sample? They are independent. Because when I told you that the person used AT&T, the probability they were a man stayed the same. Does some of you guys see the math, the proportions? If I make the proportions stay the same, then they'll be independent because they'll reduce to the same number. So there's four kings for every 52 cards. There's one king for every 13 cards. That's why king and clubs were independent because the proportions stay the same. All right. The better you are with math, the more you understand that argument. You can, you can create this thing to be independent all day long. It's really difficult to find something in real life that actually truly is independent. All right, that's enough of that. Anything else from the quiz or, or anywhere else? You guys doing all right? I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I was, in, I was in Vegas this past weekend, but... Uh, don't be too jealous because I was at a math conference. So, you know. So you work in the tables? <laughs> yeah. I gamble once. I'm not a big gambler, thank God. So I threw a dollar bill into one of these machines and, and, then, uh, and then suddenly I had 20 cents. And, so like, <laughs> and it wasn't enough to keep playing, so I just kept the ticket as a, as a, as a souvenir. So. Yay. Came out, of, came out of head. Yeah. Did you do anything fun for Pi Day? Oh yeah, oh god. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, you know. Math people off the hook. Uh, they actually had a really cool setup. They had little mini pies, of course, and you know, stuff like that. They had chicken pot pie little things. Uh, but in the back they had these really huge lit up big signs, 3, 14, 15, so we were all taking pictures around it and behind it and looking through the four and stuff. I know that's crazy. That's just crazy. But uh, open bar, so that really excited us. <laughs> we uh, we took advantage of that a lot. And the night before, uh, for some reason, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. The publisher had a uh, publishers love to court us a lot because they want us to get their books so that we make you guys spend a lot of money on their books. Um, and you know, I like that's good, yeah. But. Uh, uh, they put on this big party for us in this weird ass little bar thing, and in the corner of the, there's actually a huge bar. In the corner there's a mechanical bull. And in the back of my brain, I'm thinking, have you ever seen The Office? It felt like somewhere that Michael would have taken The Office to for uh, some kind of a party. And you see, it was I got some video of kind of old math teachers taking turns on this mechanic, getting help, and they put it on some setting where it was like. But then they had young people, and they were just getting bucked all over the place. And I'm like, I don't know if I'll do that. No, I didn't do it. Right, there's a long line of old drunk math professors waiting to get on this thing. And I'm like, I, somebody's going to have some kind of something happen. I don't, I don't want to be near that. It's going to be far away videotaping. Anyway, so that's enough of that crap. Um, I'm so happy I got all that in tape. Okay. Um, so let's get back. There's no other questions. We'll get back to this guy here. Has everybody got a copy of this from last time? Well, let me... What's up? I do. No. I have one left and I want that for me. Sorry, bud. I'll give that to you later.
you guys. So if you're on that side of the room, I'm sorry. But uh, the document camera does not want to play over there. But, you know, just play along on your own sheet. Um, We talked very quickly about this last time, but you guys were supposed to do this for homework. So how do I set this formula? What's n on this first thing? Yeah, I'm doing it 14 times. So n is always the number of trials. So remember that problem where there were like 10 questions and there were each five choices? There's a quiz, a 10 question quiz. Do you guys remember that one? question from homework? So each one had five possible answers, so the probability of success of getting a right answer on any one of those was there are five possible answers, multiple choice. You just randomly guess what's the chance you get the right answer. One out of five, good. So that would have been P, and Q would have been four fifths and so forth. N would have been 10, because you're repeating a trial 10 times. Every question is a new trial. Right, and that's how you guys feel very often when you take a test. And now we start the new trial. Yeah. Um, so N here is 14. I'm flipping this dude 14 times. Each time there's a 50-50, right? 50% chance of one or the other. So that makes this 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Probably exactly nine heads. How would I set that up? I love it. And it's perfectly fine if you realize if you have 50-50, really everything's going to be 0.5 to the N. But it's cool to set it like this. Uh, and when you plugged in a calculator, what did you guys get? Yeah. 0 0.1222. 0 0.1222. Is that good enough? Alright. How are we doing so far? So this is uh, the binomial probability section 5-4. Right, the n choose p, n choose x, uh, p x. Uh, that whole formula is from that section. Uh, now, what about this one though? What about at least two heads? At least two heads would mean you get two heads, or at least two means two heads, or three at least. Uh, you must be at least this tall. So, if you're this tall, can you get on the ride? If you must be at least this tall to ride the ride, and you're here, can you get on the ride? So at least means that or more. At most, you can be at most 12 years old to eat off the kids' menu at Denny's. So if you're 12 and a half, can you eat off the kids' menu at Denny's? No. All right, I guess, I mean, the idea of at least and at most, for some reason, students freak out about that. I don't know why. At most, the best one is what the one I have on this paper about at most six people can be on the elevator. So if that seventh person is trying to get on, you say, oh, no. Damn bad, dude. I don't want to plummet. All right. All right. So at least two heads, it would suck. It would so desperately suck to do two, three, up to 14. I've got to do this formula that many freaking times. What's the opposite of at least two heads? One minus probably a zero or one. Looks like it says word cloud, but no. Zero or one. You guys with me? So it's not just for at least one, it's any time the opposite probability has less calculations to do. Hell yes, I'm gonna do that. One minus the opposite. Because here I only have how many calculations? <laughs> How many calculations do I have? Two, zero or one. So I can do one minus 14 choose zero. So zero of these and 14 of these. Minus 14 choose one. One of these, 13 of those. We let that soak in for a second. So if I just take one and subtract all the probabilities I left out in my question, the answer must be what I'm actually asking for. Right? Whatever's left over must belong to those. So the opposite of at least two is zero or one. 
That's always, always, always true. One probability is one minus its opposite. Right? So what do you guys get for that? It's like should be close to 0 0.999. 0 0.9986. So make sure you can get that. So how are we doing there? Is that cool? Now real quick, is everybody with me on why there's two minuses there in a row? <coughs> Probably zero or one is add those probabilities together, but then I subtract both of them from one. So the minus has got to distribute to both. That's why it's one minus one minus the other. All right, I get to depress the hell out of some of you guys, man. You just don't like it. All right. <laughs> That's okay. I'm a math teacher. I knew what I was getting into. Um, all right, so now let's step forward a little bit. I don't know if you guys read this, and it's on your calculator Bible, that little handout, but you can actually do all of this in your calculator. Um, let me show you real quick how it's done. I say real quick, I, here, I'll be nice. You guys will get the computer. To get that first answer, the probability exactly nine heads. The ultimate shortcut is to go to see this right above bars where it says D I S T R, that's short for distributions. And if you hit second bars, if you want a calculator, there's a pile of them right there. Um, notice the first couple things are interesting normal, PDF, normal stuff, and then there's weird shit. But if you go to, uh, for me, it's A and B. All right, so the P means particular. The P stands for particular. So if I want a particular value, like exactly nine heads, then I use binomial PDF. If I want cumulative from zero up to something, I use the one for C, because C stands for cumulative. Right. So binomial PDF stands for particular to the PDFs. If you want a particular value, like exactly nine heads, like part A. If I want to go from zero up to something, that's cumulative, right? accumulate up to something. That's the one with the C in it. <coughs> you check it. So on a test, you got to set up the formula. you got to see the work. But you can always check your work doing this. So if you really don't understand this, don't do it. It's not part of the class to do this. It's nice to know you can check your work. Well, I haven't told you what to put in there yet. Yeah, but because my A and you pick whichever one yours is. My my, You might have more functions or less functions in your list. So go to whatever says binomial PDF. Yeah, that's F, D, B, or That's why you have to do it. Oh, yeah. All right. Un parle. Je parle français. Un peu de français. No. Mais non. 
Uh, sorry, I don't speak much French. I took two years of French in high school, and that's a long time ago. Um, so we do binomial PDF, and here's a reason why you have some grammar on your calculator. We've already seen this once before, but what you want to feed to the calculator are the three most important things the calculator needs to know. It needs to know how many times you're doing something, so in this case that's 14 and always. Then it needs to know the probability of success. Why do I not have to tell it the probability of failure? Because it's a calculator. If I tell it P is 0.6, it knows Q is 0.4. It can do that on its own. So I just need to tell it N, P, and X. How many? Probably success, and how many successes I want. So 14, comma, 0.5, comma, 9. So that's for part A. So there's your point one two 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 two. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. N T X. Yes. So if yours comes up saying trials. T uh, X. Yes. It's N P X. You feed it the same stuff, you just don't have to use commas. Yeah. Yes. So if you get, again, on your screen this is trials, P, X value, or whatever. That's NPX. <laughs> I got you. It's just because I was standing there. Um, all right, I'm already tired of this, but I'll show you the CDF real quick. On the second one, now be careful, on the second one, I want to do uh, from two and up. Binomial CDF is always zero up to something. So I actually have to do exactly what I had to do by hand. I've got to do one minus zero up to one. So if I do, you ready for that? If I do 1 minus binomial CDF, 14 comma 0.5 comma 1, the CDF tells me in whatever number I plug in the end, it's going to add from 0 up to that number. So if I subtract them from 1, it should match up with what I got for part B. And we got... Uh, 0 0.9986, and if I do this, I get something different, which makes me worried. So let me double check if we do this the long way, 14, yeah. Well, let me see if you guys can handle this. Remember, if I do 0, 14 choose 0 is 1. 0.5 to the 0 power is 1, so then I just need 0.5 to the 14th. That's 1 minus the probability of none minus the probability of 1. So I'm just doing the whole formula in there. Uh, let's see, 0.5 to the 1st. I'll be all official about it. Times 0.5 to the 13th. Yeah, it should be 0.9991. All right, so again, if you don't like binomial CDF and PDF, awesome, don't do it. It's fine with me. I want you to do it by hand anyway. Yeah? Yeah, zero up to whatever you plug in. So if I do binomial PDF 14.51, it's probably exactly one. Uh, CDF that is zero. Cool. I like it. All right, so moving on. What do you guys get for the mean? What was that? Yeah, it was 14 times 0.5, which is 7. So the mean is 7. What about the variance? It'll be 14 times 0.5 times 0.5. Right, NPQ. So that's the variance, 3.5. So what's the standard deviation? 4.6. Yeah, how do you get it? Square root. Square root of that thing. So 
So 1.871. So how do I find the minimum number of heads and the maximum number of heads to expect? How do I find that? How far do I have to go out to find that? Two standard deviations, cool, right? So if I do, if I do um, three and a half in the middle, that's the mean. And I go up and down, no, it's not the mean, just got seven in the middle, that's the mean. If I go up and down, two of these, so roughly 3.7 something. So if I go up about 3.7, I go up to about 10.7. If I go down, let's go up two of those, Jeff. So if I go up one more time, that'll be 14.4 uh, almost, right? What am I doing today? I'm doing the wrong thing. So if I go from seven, Every step I take is 1.87. So 2 oh, I already did double, didn't I? Okay. So three, double this is about 3.7. You guys with me? Double this. So I, I, I was right. So 10.7. If I go down two of these, which is 3.7, I'll be uh, 3.3 uh, 3 just about. All right. Let me stop there for a second. We've done that before. I just forgot that I doubled it already. So start at the mean and go up two steps. Start at the mean and go down two steps. So what would be an unusual number of heads? Would 11 heads be unusual? Yes. See, so earlier, remember, uh, and in the book, they were talking about if you flip a coin 400 times, would 193 be unusual or not? You know, it was kind of close to what you thought should happen, right? So now we finally know exactly how, and we've actually known this for a while, exactly how to figure out where does unusual start? So if I get four heads out of 14 flips, that's not unusual. I shouldn't be amazed at that. Cool. How are we doing? We're okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm just like, I get how to do the routine, but then I get how to do it on paper. I'm just confused as to how to check it on the calculator. Check. Like, Which one? Number two? <laughs> Part two. It says, like, at least two. Oh, well, this here would be binomial CDF 14.5, 1. Because this represents the probability of 0 or 1. When you do binomial CDF, it goes 0, and it adds all the way up to whatever number you plug in, which in this case would be 1. trying to make this connection. Now, here's the cool thing. Now, we've already done a couple of these. We figured out the probably exactly 9 was 0.122, roughly. And sure enough, if I look at this histogram, 9 heads, 0.122. You guys with me? And this is from a table of uh, binomial probability uh, uh, values. So if I had 14, here's all the values that could happen. So uh, we did at least two heads. So at least two heads would be add all these up, or I could just do 1 minus 0 0.001, which is 0.999, which is basically what we got. Okay, cool. So this is just a visual representation of all these probabilities, and what do you notice about this thing that I've already talked about last time? It looks pretty normal, right? And, and you should be expected. If my probability of success is 50%, then it should be, perfect, it should be pretty symmetric. You'll have equal amounts on both sides. The mean will be right in the middle because half of n will be right in the middle. So here's a couple things. If n or p was not big enough, and let me see if your book still has this option. I want to show you where that table came from. So back here in the appendix, there's a bunch of these tables. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that's right. So for some reason, they only go up to eight now. So it used to go up further. Now they only go up to eight. 
So if you have your book with you, this is on page 583. But now stick with me now. Do you notice how here, if the probability success is 0.01, is this first column and so forth? So if I have eight total things, I'm gonna flip the coin eight times. I'm gonna look at the 50% column, right? What would the mean be if I'm flipping a coin eight times and there's a 50% chance of getting ahead? How many heads do I expect, of course? Four. Four. And sure enough, the highest probability is for four, 0.273. And notice what happens if you just look at the numbers. Does it look normal? From zero all the way up to eight. Does that look normal? Yes. Cool. But now look. If the probability of success was 0.01 for eight flips of the coin, what's the mean? If the probability of success is 0.01, I weighted this thing so that it comes up tails 99% of the time. You with me? It's my lucky coin. Pick it up. Let's 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 flip a coin over it. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> you can trust me. So if I've weighted this thing so that the probability of success, the probability of getting ahead, is 0.01, what's the mean number of heads I expect if I'm flip it, flipping it eight times. The mean is always the same formula, right? What's the mean formula for the binomial? N times P. So I'm doing it eight times times 0.01 is what's the mean? 0.08. So I expect to get heads 0.08 times, which of course doesn't make sense. For a probability that's really low, like uh, the chance that you'll see a shooting star is so low, how do you increase your chances? Watch stars more. Say again? Watch stars more. Watch stars more. I love it. That's a very, I like that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Repeat the trial many, many, many times. It's such a low probability, but if you pick N way up, you're going to increase the average <clears throat> number you'll see. You increase probably going to see anything. So I've only flipped this thing eight times. If it's only a 1% chance of getting ahead, of course I expect like way less than one head. You gotta do this thing a lot to get some. So, and look at the distribution then. If the mean is 0.08, the highest bar should be at zero. And it is, does this look normal? Does that look normal? It starts high and it goes way low. Does that look normal? Hell no. But look, as you go over, doesn't it get more and more normal? Mm -hmm. yeah. By the, at the point you're here, it starts low, goes high, and then goes low again. It's skewed to one side, but it's getting more normal. So what I desperately want you guys to get is this idea. So if my mean is really, really low, so let's say we're doing it eight times, right? My mean is basically zero, it's going to look like that. It's gone. There's no chance for it to be normal. So where on here does it need to be so it has the best chance to be normal? Close to the center. So if my success probability was way too high, then my highest bar would be way up here, and then it goes like that. Does that look normal? No. So the whole thing I'm trying to get at is, uh, we finally are getting to the point where I have a test to see if something is normal enough. So if the mean is pulled out from that wall far enough, it has room to go up and then come back down. Let me say that again. If that mean is pulled away from that wall, so when the mean, when the probability of success was 0.5, the average was 4, right in the middle. So then it had room to go up and then come back down. So that looks like it could be normal, right? So the mean has got to be big enough, right in the middle. The mean of success is NP, but also the mean failures has to be right in the middle too, NQ. Now think about it, if you do N times P to get the mean number of successes, N times Q would be the mean number of failures. So they both have to be somewhere in the middle, and what comes out is this. If NP is greater than 5, and NQ is greater than 5. I can't remember. This book, I think it says greater than or equal to. I always forget. One book says one thing, and the other book says the other thing. But 5 is kind of like the determining factor. 
If NP and NQ are bigger than equal to five, all that means visually is you pulled your middle, your highest bar, you put it more in the middle so there's room for it to grow and shrink. So why was this one, why is this one so beautiful? Because the highest bar is exactly in the mm -hmm. middle. And what was NP? Which is bigger than five. So if NP and NQ are both bigger than five, here's a phrase we're gonna say a lot during this course, then it's normal enough. It's not, I can't say it's perfectly normal, but I can say it's normal enough to do like empirical rule stuff, stuff like that. Okay, 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 maybe some of us with it, all right. So let me see real quick, the last couple questions here. Um, so, Given all this data now, it's easier for you to do this. What's probably at most six heads? So at most six heads. So we, I can have at most six people come to a, a party. How many people does that mean? Can seven people come to my party and I'll be all right? No, no right? I ain't got that much money. I teach. What the hell you want from me? So, I have a, so at most six heads means six or below. I like it. So it's very quick. How do you get that? What do you do? Yeah. No, no, no. From the chart here, you just add up the probabilities. Now you can do CDF, sure. That's never good enough as the first thing to do. Just add those probabilities up. And what do you get? Sorry? 0 0.395. 0 0.395. Okay. All right. Now remember that we're going to come back to that, well, maybe today if we got time. The big thing I, I talked about last time before we did the quiz, and then I want to remind you guys about, is probabilities are all about finding the area. If I'm given the probability distribution, whatever it looks like, normal, whatever, if I can find the area corresponding to my question, that's the probability. I'm done. And you can see that happening. I just took the areas of the rectangles, added them up, that's the total area. That's the probability. They're the same thing. It's beautiful. So you got the math of it with the formula and all that kind of stuff, but you've got a visual that's really nice. Now, unfortunately for us, the formula that governs the normal curve it is not exactly something that most of us would consider to be pretty. Me, I do. I think it's very pretty, but I'm weird. Uh, I want to show it to you once. And then you never have to look at it again if you don't want to. But let me zoom way the hell in on this pretty little dude. Ah, cute little dude. Yummy. But do you see something that's familiar? What do you see that's familiar? <laughs> it's like an eye test. Can you see it now? Yeah. What do you see that's familiar? X and mu. Yeah, X, mu, sigma. I like it. So this is this is a formula for something called the, the Gaussian curve. And the normal distribution is one example of, of a family Gauss, Gauss curves. So this we all know. This is very interesting that that shows up, right? Just had its big day. Uh, sigma, of course, we all know, and so forth. E, we should all know. We all know E, don't we? It's the thing that governs the population of rabbits. Throw some rabbits in a room, give them some food. Later you'll see how many. But it's to a negative power, so it's actually going down. So a normal curve looks like this. It goes down because of this negative here. And it's squared, so it looks sort of like a parabola in the middle. So you can see some of the reason why it looks the way it does from the formula. That's the most you ever have to look at that formula if you don't want to. I'll take it away. Whoa. All right. So, what I really want to spend some time on today, well, first off, let me give you this kind of a problem. Uh, I think we did a little bit of this really quickly last time, but this is in the book, too. So if I have something what's called a uniform distribution, it's exactly what it sounds like. All the probabilities are uniform. They're all the same. 
So basically the most boring probability distribution. But it's the easiest one, of course. So let me see if you guys can get this. If I have a distribution from zero to four, and it's uniform, so it looks like that. So that's uniform distribution. It also happens to be symmetric. It's the most boring symmetric. It flips the rectangle over, and it falls on top of itself. <laughs> now remember, I don't care what the distribution looks like. The whole area has to be what, since it's related to probabilities? 100% or better, one. <laughs> Right? So the whole area, the total area has got to be 1. Okay. And there's a lot of stuff that has nor uh, uniform distribution. Uh, roll a die, a normal die that has been weighted. Uh, all the probabilities for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What is each probability going to be? Probably I get a 1 if I roll a die. 1 sixth, right? You guys kind of with me here? A little bit, a little bit. So that would be a uniform distribution. None of them are more likely or less likely. They're all equally likely. So, but how tall does this have to be then for this area to be one? If it's one, what's the area? Four times one. See now, see, it's just area. So how tall does this have to be so the area is what? One fourth. Why? What's the area now? Length, how long is it? Four. How wide is it? One. one fourth. And what's the area? One. All right. Nothing magic there. How are we doing? Is that cool? No. No? What's up? I'm sorry. So you really just have to find out how wide it is and do one divided by that. Uniform distributions are almost too easy to really understand. You're like, it can't just be that. It is. So if I wanted to know what's the probability from one to two, What's that area? That's all I gotta find is that area. One to two. See how I say that? The probability of the numbers between one and two. How do I find that? What's the area of that rectangle? Yeah, it's gonna be one times a fourth, so it's one times a fourth, it's one fourth. There's a one fourth chance that it's gonna be in there, whatever this number represents from zero to four. How are you guys doing? All right, all right. And then, I mean, there's nothing, there's no way to make this harder. I mean, uh, from 2.3 to 3.79, what's probably that? What did I say, 3.79? Yeah, it'll be 1.49. Right, that's how wide it is, 1.49 times, how tall is it? It's always a fourth tall. So whatever the hell that is, 0.3725, sweet. So you have a 37.25% chance of something, whatever this is, falling within there. Maybe this is like a GPA somewhere, for the most boring school in the world. <laughs> Let's give, we already gave too many fours, but not enough zero, so you get a zero. Oh shit, I needed to go to this place. All right, is that, and I keep stressing the idea of area being the same as probability, because it is. Now what sucks, and I think I said this last time, this shape, this shape, is the formula behind this shape nice? I showed it to you. Most of you, I think, would not say that's nice. Do you want to work with that formula? Are you with me in the room? <laughs> I see people. Have I gone have I gone seen up? I'm like, early senility. I've walked into an empty room. People walk by like, what the hell is he doing? If I told you to find the area from, so here's zero. This is a normal curve. It's been made into z-scores, right? So I got zero and I got negative one. So if I ask you between negative one and one, you all know the answer. Ooh. Right, you should. If you don't, uh. <laughs> but if I said what what's the area from negative one point eight seven to zero point six one? Holy shit. <laughs> There's no way. How do you get the area of this? 
Is it length times, whoa, shit, okay, what the freak? What's the height, what the hell? I don't have curvy area formulas really besides a circle. So approximated with this? No, screw that. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is, if you've never had calculus, I'm not gonna suddenly teach it to you, but one thing calculus does well is it finds areas under curves. So what they did is they applied calculus to the formula that I showed you guys earlier, and they made this big ass table. So let me give you this big ass table. You got a copy of it in the back of your book. Before we get too far, this is your official z-score table. You must bring this with you to every test from now on. Do not write anything on this. Maybe your name, just to make sure you get it back. You guys with me? Don't write any notes. I don't want to see any erasures. Maybe you can write something like circle something if you want to, but you don't want to screw your future self over, so don't do that too much, right? You with me? All right, it's not a, a, not a note sheet. So obviously one of the first things we need to do is figure out how the hell to read this thing. So hopefully, make sure, first thing, make sure you have a negative z-score side and a positive z-score side. You cannot trust my printer. It likes to screw around on me. So here's the idea. I, uh, I, I want to show you how to read this chart, but I want to do it in a very specific way. Let me see if you guys can answer this question. Um, for a normal curve, what area would be below negative one C score? We know this. What area would be in here? 68%, right? Normal curve, empirical rule takes over, right? So this chart is empirical rule on steroids. It's not just one, two, three, it's freaking negative 3.07, blah, 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 blah. You with me? That's really what this chart's trying to do. So now we know everything, because I can just look at the chart. And all those numbers came from calculus, figuring out the areas under that curve. So we're standing on the shoulders of calculus. Uh, so what? if that's 68%, how much is outside? How much is out here? 32, so how much is over there? 16%. So the way this chart works, let's see if we can capture that back and that's still not exactly right it's but it rounds to 16 percent let's check it so how do i read this crazy thing negative z scores is where i want to go so i'm talking about the z score negative one so I go to negative one and notice this if i want a negative 1.02 i would go negative 1.02 these are the second decimal places up here this is why I said before, I said we're later going to make z-scores to two decimal places, so I just sort of always did that. And this is why, because our chart only goes out two places. So if I look at negative 1.0, and I want, now I want negative 1.00. I want negative 1 exactly. So what area do we get? So if I look at negative 1.00, I get 1587. 15.87%, which rounds to 16%. So you can recapture all of the empirical rule statements in this chart. They're all there. 
So now we just expanded what we could, we, we could do very limited things before. They had to fall exactly on one, two, or three. Now we could do any damn thing, right? So for example, my question, let's see. Well, this might be, let's see if we can do this. Oh shit, you're looking the wrong way. All right, I'll get you later. <laughs> Camera's like, I am not alive, dude. Oh, I just erased it. Let me do a couple of examples here. Let's see if you guys, so make sure you guys can actually read that thing. Call me over if you need some help. I want to know the probability that the z-score is less than 2.87. So this area here. If you really want to be nice to yourself, you will draw the picture. People that don't draw the picture are the ones that make the most mistakes. So let me know if you need help on how to read that chart. Or collaborate with people near you. That's fine. This is positive 2.87, right? So look at the correct side. So little people flip it. All right. So where's 2.87? So I go to the positive z-score side. Here's 2.8. And 7. Oh, where's 2.8? 2.8 is a white one. Jeff, here we go. 2.8. 7. Sweet. 9979. Right. You guys over there take my word for it. <laughs> Let me know if you can't find that on your z-score chart. I love the 7. So that means anytime you look up a z-score, what area do you always find? Does anybody pick up on that on this chart? You will always find the area that's how related to the z-score you looked up. It's always where. Where's the area? If you look up a z-score on this chart, the area it gives you is always below it. So the question is, what's the area below 2.87? Sweet, that's what the chart tells me. Right? So that was. I forgot. Point nine so not good. So if I ask you, what's the probability that z is greater than negative point one four? There's two ways you can handle that. Mini chart. One greater than negative point one four. So one way you can do this is to just go ahead and look up negative point one four. You'll get point four 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 three. Where's that on the chart? So the minute you look up an area in the chart, you put it up here, bam. Point, you forgot you. Four, 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 three. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Is that the answer? No, because we were nice to ourselves. We actually drew the damn picture, so I could see that's not the shaded part, Jeff. Sorry, Jeff. So how do I find this side? It's so funny to me how, for a lot of you guys, that's more natural now. That's one probability, I want the opposite probability. So I just do one minus. Whereas before, we were having tons of problems. This is a little bit easier. That's just the other freaking side. So one minus this. Have I ever shown you this? Make everything nine except to make the last one 10. Five, 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 seven. That's what one minus that is. Or, you know, just use your calculator. If you want to do one minus a decimal less than between zero and one, you just make all you make that nine. What makes that nine? Five, 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 and then make the last one ten. Some of you guys might realize why that works. You add that extra one from the ten, and it makes the whole thing go from nine, 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 nine to one. Well, that's a really cool little trick because it happens a lot. Uh, if you're not comfortable with numbers, I would probably double check that on the calculator. 
Just make sure you've got it, so you might as well use it. Cheers. One last one we'll do together, and then I've got a whole chart, a whole little handout for you guys to work on. Take a second and draw the picture for that third situation. Can you draw the picture for that situation? And I don't understand. Please understand that in the middle of the z-score chart will be what number? Zero. And it is a real number line. So I never understand when people draw this. Here's zero. Here's 1.29. And here's 3.12. And I'm like, what the freaking hell? So they get the right answer, but then they erase it. They're like, no, I can't be right. It's not big enough. No, well, no, 1.2 is over there. Shit. <laughs> Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So if you draw the picture correctly, it will help you. If you don't, it will hurt you. But it's just a number line. Don't, don't think anything other than that. So it should be no. Here's zero. It doesn't matter if you get it exactly right. Obviously, this is just a visual aid for us. So here's the area that I want. If I look up 3.12, do I get the area that I want? No. Do I get more than I want? Yes, because if I look up 3.12, it's going to be from 3.12 all the freaking way, actually down to negative infinity, to be honest. But Right? Because the chart tells me the whole area below the z-score I look up. So how much too much did I get? I got exactly this much too much. Well, how much area is this? The area below that. So you look up this z-score, you get its area. You look up this z-score, you get its area, and then you subtract. I love it. The visual helps you. So draw the picture, dear God. Learn from past classes. Pick up in my voice. But that's what killed a lot of people. They didn't draw the picture. We'll save time. I'll get to my F quicker. Come on. I don't understand it. F is taking too long. So if you look up 3.12, you guys tell me out. What do you get? What area do you get? Yeah, 9991. I like it. So then you put it, you always put areas up here. Because z-scores can sometimes look like areas. It sucks. So let me say this again. Notice how slowly I'm talking compared to how I normally talk. So this is an important point. Z scores down here. Areas up here. Because they can look like each other and screw you up. You with me? Uh, I don't have one up here, but if I just said positive 0.14, you might think that's 14% if you put it in the wrong damn place. All right, so the minute you get an area, you plop it up here. What's the area below 1.29? Who do what's? Yeah, good. 0.9015. That's 1.29. Please, please don't uh, hesitate to tell me right now if you're having any trouble with this chart. It won't make any sense to tell me after the next test or something. So let me know if you're having any trouble with this chart. When you look up 1.29, of course I forgot already. What was it? 0.9015. Is that it? Okay, thank you. You're like, no, but let's just say it is. So then, what's the actual area that I want? What's the answer to the question then? Oh boy, you have to do that one again. Point. There you go. Cool. So, like a 9.8% chance something will be in there. So, these are heights. Here's the normal height. What's probably somebody's height is in between these two, almost 10% chance. What percentage of the population would be between there? Almost 10% of the population. They mean the same thing. All right, before I give you this handout, one last type. Uh, because they're not all, now, now, the more interesting thing is what I just said. I'm not always gonna give you Z-scores. I'm not gonna say, well, your Z-score height is obviously uh, 0.49. And yours, no, you're going to give me the heights, and then I'm going to change them into a z-score, right? So who remembers the z-score formula? Z 
equals So let's do one example like this, and then I'll give you this handout to work on. Uh, given a normal distribution, uh, the mean, let's do men's height, 69. Standard deviation is 2. Point, uh, I think it's 2.5 inches. I remember that. So we actually did this with empirical rule, but I had to be careful and make them fall on exactly one or two. So now I can say, what's probably that some dude, some randomly selected dude, is taller than 76 and a half inches tall? So obviously, you can't just look that number up in the chart because that number ain't in the chart. You with me? What sucks is when this number is like 1.8 or something for some, some problem and you think 1.80, z-score, yeah, no, you gotta make, Change it into a z-score first, because that's the only thing the chart understands. So how do I change that? Well, let's first draw it. What goes in the middle now? Good. Underneath that, in parentheses, I'm going to put zero. I remember when I learned this, our instructor forced us to draw two different pictures. One with the 69 and 76 and a half, and the other one with zero, one, two, the z-scores. Doesn't make any damn sense. It's the same stupid picture, right? So just put the zero for the z-score there. Where's 76.5? Over there, good, all right. So you, see, you won't believe how often I have people just kind of put it wherever. And I want greater than that, so where am I gonna shape? Up, oh, I love it, it's great. But again, wouldn't believe. So if I can change this into a z-score, I can do it exactly like we were doing that stuff earlier, right? So how do I change this into a z-score? I use the formula. So if it starts as what are known as raw scores. Raw scores are the ones that have actual units. That many inches tall, this many dollars per year, that many dogs in the backyard, this many TVs now, whatever. That's a raw score. You've got to process it into a z-score. Maybe. Like raw sugar versus... The white sugar, right? Mm -hmm. Force been processed. I personally kind of like raw sugar. Um, so what's the z-score for this? What's the formula going to look like? Yeah, my x-score, my score, the mean is always second divided by 2.5. What do you guys get for that? Three. Three? All right, sweet. Good job, John. So that's three. So then how do you, let me show you, I'll show you the shortcut on this one too. Some of you guys might realize it's a shortcut because of the symmetry. The symmetry. So uh, we'll do it the long way first. If I look up three on the chart, what area do I get? Beautiful. 3.00 is 0.9987, but where does that go on the picture? Yeah, so obviously the answer is tiny. So don't tell me the answer is 99.9, no, right? I already forgot, what the hell's wrong with you? 9987. <laughs> Maybe it is early onset, so no. 9987. So the actual answer, make it nines, zero, zero, one, make the last one 10. Three. Here's the shortcut. You do not have to use the shortcut. Complete option if you understand it. The area that's above 3 is exactly the same as the area that's below negative 3 because of the symmetry. So instead of doing 1 minus that, now I can just look up negative 3 and get the answer directly. Negative 3 is the area 0.0013. Holy shit. And it's not a surprise because of the symmetry, it only makes sense. All right, so now I'm finally going to shut the hell up. I want you guys to work on this. You can work on it together. 1, D, and E, I'm not even going to talk about. I'm going to let you guys try to see if you can figure it out. Because that's just the way it goes. You can't figure it out, don't freak out. This is not a quiz.
So just to let you know in the homework, section 6.2 is all about z-scores. Section 6.3, you have to change the x into z. So section 6.2 is like the first problems we're doing, just z-scores. You can go right to the chart. Section 6.3, they're going to give you raw scores, heights, and so forth. You've got to change them into z-scores. So that's the difference between number one and number four, apparently. I decided two and three has gotten way too much use. <laughs> what did I do in Vegas? I don't know.